Disney Plus brings together fans of all ages. This podcast brings three adults who are also kids at heart together to talk about Disney Plus. Join Scott, the Magic Genie producer, Regina, the sassy Megara of the group, and Nathan, the gentle but grumpy Brit, as they bring you news, reviews, special guests, and discussions on the Disney Plus Streamcast. Hello, and thanks for joining us for the Disney Plus Streamcast. I'm Scott Murray, and I'm here with Regina Davis. Hello. We are officially here to tell people that the Disney Plus Streamcast has not been canceled due to coronavirus. Because this is one of those things you can continue to do even if you're in quarantine. Or if you're just self-quarantine and you're just going to be safe and stay home. Podcasting is still something you can do whether you're recording it or listening to it. Right? Ugh, I'd love to self-quarantine, but I have to go to work. It's, I just can't work from home. Well, then they're going to have to take extra care of you guys down there. We're doing as much as we can. Did you notice that one of the things that Disney did over the weekend to kind of give parents and Disney fans a little something was they released Frozen 2 early, and people were able to start watching that last weekend? I think that is the coolest thing ever, Isn't that it? they took that little initiative to just make it a little easier on everybody. With that movie, they don't, you don't have to sit there and go, yeah, but if we release this, will they watch it? <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, for sure, it was an absolute, like, sure thing on their part. But I don't think that minimizes the gesture at all. No, I definitely I think it's still not. sweet. <laughs> well, that is one of the things that I saw in the Disney news this past week. But to get the rest of the news from this past week, it's time for News with Nathan. Hi, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Better now. You know, it's it's been terrible. It's been a terrible, <laughs> terrible week. It's been so terrible. People around here are just, they're frustrated. They're upset. And it's all because I bought this ukulele in honor of Grace Vanderwaal, who I know we're talking about in a little bit, and I've been tormenting them all week with it. It's really hard to play, you guys. Sorry, I can't so just anything with it at all. <laughs> Does this it's mean so you're going bad. to sing the news to us today? Uh, you know what? I, I don't. <laughs> the last time I did that, people were really upset. So I just, Apparently I, they're already I, upset. Yeah, so <laughs> I was trying. I, I don't know if it's in tune. Um, anyway, I had a go, you guys. I, I figured I had to do something, um, keep the old home fires burning. As you said, uh, coronavirus, big deal at the moment, certainly hit Disney really, really hard. Yeah, tough week for everyone in the entertainment industry, in movies and all that. Um, box office this weekend, a 22-year low. $55.3 million was the take this weekend. 45% down from last uh, week. 85% uh, down overseas. Uh, and you've got to think, this time last year, the big tentpole picture was Captain Marvel. It's been a year since Captain Marvel. Can you believe that? No. And um, the what big one this weekend is is Bloodshot, which don't me wrong, I like a Valiant comic. Shout out Exo Man of War. Um, if you haven't read it, you should. Hmm. But it's not the same. It's not the same. People aren't going out to the movies, practicing the old social distancing if they can even get into a movie. And for sure, you know Disney did close the parks. Um, they've also gone and bumped. Uh, release dates for a bunch of their upcoming movies. Uh, Mulan was supposed to come out this month. Not anymore. That's been postponed. Same with New Mutants and Antlers, two of the movies that they inherited from the Fox merger. But um, yeah, analysts suggest that despite all this happening so late in the quarter, probably going to hit Disney's profits down about 7.6%, they think. So a paltry $20 billion this quarter. But, you know, whenever you have that many shareholders, that's kind of a bit of a dent. And certainly one of the questions that came up at that annual general shareholders meeting not so long ago was, um, what are we doing for original content on Disney Plus? Well, not a lot at the moment, because all the shows that we were so hyped for, Falcon and Winter Soldier, mm -hmm. Loki, WandaVision, they've all been postponed temporarily 
coronavirus and likes crowds and there's lots of people on on movie sets and so all that has just come to a halt pre-production does continue where possible remotely so things like moon knight she hulk uh, ms marvel if nothing else guys it promises to be like a chock full 2021 or the back end of the year if this keeps on going no kidding but in the meantime, like you said, um, we can all watch Frozen 2. Uh, Disney CEO Bob Shapek said the company was pleased to share it, uh, the movie earlier, saying that the themes of perseverance and the importance of family are messages that are incredibly relevant during this time. And we are pleased to be able to share this heartwarming story early with our Disney Plus subscribers to enjoy at home on any device. That's really awesome. Fingers crossed they do it for Black Widow. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> you know? Both at Disneyland and Disney World, everybody, you know, every time you leave the park, if you stay till it closes, uh, a lot of the employees come out and a lot of the characters come out to wave goodbye and thank you, see you again soon. And it was just kind of weird to, you know, because people were showing the video of that happening, but this time it's, it was a little more, you know, kind of sad. It's going to close for an extended period of time because it's, you know, one of those places that rarely ever actually closes. Mm -hmm. So... That was rough, but what was really tough for me, the people I really sympathize with and, and hope they get their makeup real soon are people that I saw on Facebook that had plans to go to the parks during the time that it's closed, obviously not knowing if this was going to happen, and some of those people were really anticipating going because they were going to Galaxy's Edge for the first time. Mm-hmm. I talked to my wife a little bit about it uh, today, and apparently the parks are... Uh, trying to work with people that had vacations and plans scheduled that got canceled. So I think it's really tough for a lot of people, especially because there's a huge percentage of parents that are going to have to explain to young kids that this trip that they'd probably been hyping up for months is not going to happen because of a reason that a lot of kids can't even conceptualize. So there's just going to be so many bummed out kids. And so that's why I'm hoping that Disney Plus really keeps doing things like this, you know, Frozen 2 edition, you know, just to keep the peace at home. Unless you did what my brother and sister-in-law did. Whereas we took my niece to Disney last year for her first time. She's uh, seven. They wanted it to be a surprise. And I've seen some people do this and they'll video, they'll video record it where they don't let the kid know till the day they leave you know you get the reaction and then you get to say and we're going right now <laughs> oh my gosh pack up we're going right now so if that was your plan you might actually have yourself covered um, right i feel like there's probably if there's any parents that have done that they're probably like oh thank god yeah, right? can you imagine <laughs> if we told her told him or her sooner uh, i'm sure there are some of those though and that's that's tough but you just got to tell them we're going to go we just can't go on this day yet Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully everyone will make good on that. And uh, I can see Disney, you know, the creators of those marvelous experiences, those fantastic memories, um, letting someone fall by the wayside on, on account of something like this. That's not really what they're known for. Not at uh, all. <laughs> no. So other news and bits from their annual shareholder meeting. Bob Shapek got to lead the new Disney CEO, got to lead a lot of the meeting. Bob, I, you're more than happy to pass off the reins to him and let him take charge. Uh, he said, I've never been more excited, and maybe that's to be expected, but I do understand the gravity of trying to fill this gentleman's shoes, but I'm ready for it, and I look forward to some great years ahead. Bob Iger said about Bob Chapek, I can't think of a better person to succeed me in this role. Bob is someone that we know very well, and he knows our company very well. He'll do an outstanding job leading our company into its next century as its seventh CEO. They said, you know, they they, they know that coronavirus is is uh, going to have an impact on them. And they're they're pretty resilient, pretty bullish, all the same about uh, everything that's going on. They said, we're all sobered by the concern we all feel for everyone affected by this global crisis. Disney has been through a lot, including wars and economic downturns and disasters. We are incredibly resilient. Our future has always been bright and it remains so for good reason. And uh, they did say about how, you know, they have so many different creative engines in play that, you know, they, they feel pretty assured that they're going to be successful for years to come something else that i was really really interested to hear about was that they've actually got the rights to the new peter jackson let it be documentary about the beatles that's going to land on their services not saying where or how but towards the end of this year but i guess uh, when they were doing um the making of let it be back in the day the band was at like kind of breaking point um they really didn't like each other 
those sessions were really, really, really terrible. And people started quitting and falling out all over the place. But it was kind of whitewashed. The band knew that it would hurt their image and hurt their brand if that made it into the movie theatres. So they had like a real sanitised, clean version. Well, apparently Peter Jackson, he's got 55 hours of unreleased footage, 140 hours of more or less unheard audio recordings. And he's promising to put together something really amazing and really insightful. He's got all the rest of the the widows and the, the remaining performers on board with it. Is this the uh, time when the Beatles kicked out the fifth Beatle, Clarence, who played the saxophone? <laughs> I'm lost. As am I. <laughs> there was a great classic skit on Saturday Night Live where Eddie Murphy claimed that he was the fifth Beatle and was kicked out of the band. Scott. And he, play- he played the saxophone. <laughs> you know, said- I think you have to... And apparently, I understand you've got an international audience here. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, but they even played a clip where if you play their songs backwards, you can hear Paul and Ringo talking about how they're going to kick, kick Clarence out of the band and steal all of his ideas. <laughs> I swear to God, I thought he was going to say something like, it was in that scene in Muppet Caper. <laughs> yeah, the, when... yeah, the Beatles in Muppet <laughs> Caper. <laughs> anyway. <In any> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, a new Beatles documentary, September fourth, uh, apparently premiering. Um, I don't know. I'm super psyched for that. That sounds Appar- incredible. Yeah. Apparently, the the last gig they ever did was the kind of rooftop performance at the at Apple Core, and they've got it all. They've only ever shown 21 minutes of it on the uh, original movie, which hasn't even been out for years. You know, never made it to Blu-ray or DVD. It was off VHS in the early 80s, so no one's actually had it for forever. That version's actually coming back out in 20, uh, 2021. But, um, yeah, it's uh, allegedly got the whole concert on there and lots of other insightful bits, all the bloopers, all the outtakes of the band arguing and storming out and all that good stuff. So um, I can't wait. I, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah, and uh, something else, which was just interesting. If you're a new listener to the show, welcome, welcome. Um, some of the stuff we talk about is the original content on Disney+, Plus. what's coming out, and you know what you look forward what you can look forward to uh if you go to hollywoodreporter.com if you look at bob Iger, it's got a really fascinating article about his next priorities uh which is it's got lots of like kind of insider sources on it and they're pretty legit because it's a hollywood reporter and when he moved to his executive chairman role he said that his main job was to shore up creative and make sure that's all working so that there's lots of stuff coming out and so it talks about what that essentially means for him which is getting disney plus going and it talks about a bunch of the tonal shifts they've had with the shows that they had in pre-production they got cancelled or moved to hulu and we've talked about that a little bit here but certainly if you're a new subscriber and you're a new listener to the show it's a really great resource to catch you up on all the the comings and goings of those uh, production staffs and what they're up to and my last thing is if you go to the marvel website they've got a whole behind the scenes thing about the uh avengers campus that opens in disneyland in july 18th that place looks amazing with the animatronic spidey zipping around between the buildings on top of the campus you get to see the merch that's coming as well and the stark industries intern sweatshirt looks pretty fantastic i'm a fan of the merch much in the same way galaxy's edge has the lightsabers and the droids for you to build you can actually get yourself a spider bot, which is like a spider drone thing decked out in whatever hero colors you want with different payloads to attach with those different things. They talk about a couple of the rides they have there, like the Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. They talk about the uh, the web slinging ride that there is where apparently it's got gesture recognition. So you can stand in front of this screen with a bunch of people and you can thwip with your hands like you've got web shooters on and shoot webs all these different rogue drones the thing that i really dug about it was the the pim test kitchen (laughs) where they have giant versions and tiny versions of food like the pimini which is like a a panini that's got a pim particle stuck in it so it's like two foot long and nine inches wide and if you go with me i'm not sharing 
I'm eating that all by myself. Um, but maybe you can have the chicken sandwich, which is literally the size of your face on a tiny, tiny, tiny bun. And they also have lots of really cool cocktails as well that are all served in pretty fancy like beakers and test tubes and things like that. So lots of ways to spend your money. So, you know, if you don't get to go to Galaxy's Edge this month, next month, you know what? Wait for the refund to come through. Go in the summer. Go and hit Avengers Campus as well. You'll probably have a blast there. But again, more information on Marvel.com about that. And uh, that's what I've got for you guys. Love it. Speaking of Beaker. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to let... segue. I don't want to let Regina downs because when you were first talking about these big portions, these enlar- these this enlarged food uh, selection, I thought about the Muppet movie. Remember they they made an eight foot prune. I, I don't even know what to say right now. Animal takes the Insta Grow pills, and that's how he becomes really big and scares the bad guys away at the end of the film. But they were oh. testing it when they walked in, and they had an eight-foot prune. Or maybe it was a four-foot prune. A big prune. So, if you like prunes... <laughs> Who doesn't like a nice prune? <laughs> <laughs> you just, yeah, cool. <laughs> we had a chance to watch Stargirl, which just hit Disney+. Plus, and we've already had a chance to see it, and we're going to talk about it. That's next on the Disney Plus Streamcast. Well, we mentioned a few minutes ago that the folks over at Disney released Frozen 2 a little early for everybody, knowing that there were going to be parents and kids home for an extended period of time. But, you know, that's not the only thing that's new or even the only thing you can watch on Disney+. Plus. Before we get into our featured discussion today on Stargirl... Did you all have a chance to watch anything else this past week besides uh, Stargirl? Um, I decided to go ahead and dive into the new reality show called Shop Class mm-hmm. that's hosted by Justin Long. Um, I was I was ready for it to be pretty hokey, um, but it's actually very very good um, as far as you know challenges and it actually being intriguing to watch. I sort of thought it was just going to be like a bunch of like preteens crafting. Um, I was wrong about that. There's one kid in the first episode named Sam. He's 13 and he did so well in his woodworking class that they just made him a TA for all the other classes. Hmm. And, you know, he they they say things about these kids like and he won first place for his regatta build. Like, what the hell? These kids are so interesting and talented. They're just absolutely so impressive. And I thought that some of the projects were going to be pretty simple. But the first thing they did was build, you know, one of those little free libraries And I thought it was just going to be, oh, we're just going to build a little house on the pole. But then you've got these like 12 to 14 year old kids saying things like, oh, you know, well, we've decided to go with like a Frank Lloyd Wright mid-century modern design. (laughs) And I'm just like, what am I watching? Was I the dumbest 13 year old of all time? But, you know, these kids are just so impressive to watch. And they, they all have a shop class teacher that's assigned to each team. And the things they come up with and the things, the the fundamental knowledge that they seem to already have is just mind-blowing. And the things that they make are really, really cool. And I I think it's just a really impressive show. And I've only watched the first couple episodes, but I absolutely love it. I love it. And yeah. Justin Long is a fantastic reality show host. I didn't know I would ever say that. It's really cool. And then, you know, you see them do all of this really technical work, but then you'll also see them make decisions that reminds you that they're a bunch of preteens because, you know, they're building this free little library and they've got, you know, a a panel of judges. One is an architect, one's an interior designer. And the third one is actually an active Imagineer, 
which I thought was really cool. Hmm. Um, one of the judges walk over to a table and, you know, sort of get the gist of what the kids are doing so far. And the judge recommends that they start utilizing the whole form, you know, make sure they're giving every single piece of this contraption a function. And so, you know, she was basically telling them to do something with the base. And so the kids decide that, you know, oh, well, what's better to put under a free little library than a beehive? Because they wanted to attract bees because their message was, you know, saving the planet or something. And I'm just like, I don't know if that's a combination you really want. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know if people are going to want to walk up to that little library if you're, you have a beehive attached to it. But the message is sweet. And so I, you know, go on and build it. But it's just a really heartwarming show. But also, if you're just genuinely into, you know, crafting and building things, it's also just very, very interesting. Nathan, did you see anything other than Stargirl this week? Uh, unfortunately, yes, yes, I did. Oh, um, no. Because uh, you know we have the off-air chats about what we're doing with our time and all the rest of it. Uh, and as you you know, our listeners won't know Scott, but you'll know that uh, Regina sort of somewhat dared me in a way to have a dive into Encore, <laughs> saying that oh, you're gonna you're gonna hate that show because it's got <laughs> musicals and people you don't like. And so you watched um, Encore. I watched four episodes. Mm. Of God, yes. And I'm I'm ready for my refund, Mr. Iger. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, in case you're unfamiliar with with the you know the the notion of the show, I guess a couple of years ago, Disney on their like primetime ABC thing, they did Encore reunion, which was say they took a whole bunch of people who did Into the Woods in high school. And they got them all back together many years later and made them do it again. And it was, like I think, done over two nights. And they liked it so much, or they could do it so cheap, that they thought, you know what, we should totally do this again. So it's funny to me that, you know, Kristen Bell, you know, she's all over it at the beginning, where it's like, this is encore. And she's executive producer, and Disney is quite quick to tell, you know, hey, Kristen Bell is in this, and uh, she was in Frozen. This is true. She is in it, and she was in Frozen. However, if you like Frozen and you were going to watch this because of Kristen Bell, you would be disappointed because she's in it for like 30 seconds at the beginning doing the intro, and then she pops up a little bit at the end of episode one for giggles, and then you don't see her again. She's gone. She doesn't even do the narration. It's all reality TV stuff. So what they do is get various high school classes over the last like 20 odd years, I think maybe 30, uh, get them back together, and in five days, make them do the same musical they did back in the day, but with a better supporting cast in that they have people from Broadway come in and choreographers in episode two when they do Beat and the Beast. They had Susan Egan, who is amazing. I will say that I don't like musicals, but I recognize talent when I see it. Right. And the way she was, and she was in, she was the original Broadway lead in Beauty and the Beast, and she came in to help these dudes out and to help them really feel the songs and everything. And her direction to Belle, and no lies, goosebumps, fantastic. But those moments are few and far between because what you normally get, and I say, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched the High School Musical episode because Regina said it was especially bad. I watched Annie because that was the first one. I watched Annie Get Your Gun and there was one more I watched, which it will come to me. It doesn't matter. It was still bad, but <laughs> it's, really, but really, um, what you do, you get all these people. The format is the same. You get one bloke who's super cocky, who thinks, yeah, I could have done this with my life. And instead he hasn't. <laughs> and he's, and he's there. There's the love interest in all these. There's always a love interest. Oh, did you know she, he was seeing so and so, but then he dumped her terribly whenever she went off to college and they kind of have like a bit of a, you know, reunion kind of like oh. try and get closure on these things. And it's all totally cringe. It's cringe it's for them disgusting. because um, you're watching that thinking, mate, you're 40 years old. This happened 20 odd years ago. You've got a <laughs> wife and kids now. Can you not put that behind you? Why are you crying? So you see them kind of work out the issues. There's always like the nerdy one who ends up becoming a stone cold fox the foxy one who probably got into an accident or something terrible happened to her, but she, she became a stay-at-home mom and didn't go to Harvard and whatever else. And people are like, oh, look at you. You've changed. 
<laughs> among all of it, there's always one person who's like, yeah, you know what? This is great. I could do this. I love being on stage. And in fact, there's one that guy in the um, the high school musical episode that you just kind of love to hate him because he's so full of it. Like he thinks he's he's got it. He's getting like voice lessons from this dude who's helped people win Tony Awards. And at the end, oh. he's like, you know, he went out for the role of Troy, the lead. He mm-hmm. ended up getting, I think, was it Ryan, the Sharpay's mate or whatever yeah. it was? And, dude, and he was he, so end, ready. He's like, Dude, I you know I quit my job so I can do this full time, and you're like, you loon, you dolt, what have you done? Like you did your what? Your family. How are you gonna pay your bills when you know you're on the street busking or something? Because there's no <laughs> way anyone's taking a show. chance on you. And at the end, they get on stage and do what they do, kind of in a somewhat mediocre fashion, and everyone's kind of like, oh, look at that, fair play, they had a good go, didn't they? As they stumble through their choreography and kind of flub some of their notes. It is a redemptive thing for a lot of these people, which in a very, very real way is sad. I mean, I had a miserable experience at school. I didn't go on about it. You know, just kind of take what life gave you and move on. These people are not content to do that, and they want their 15 minutes. And that's what's really, really sad about all of this, um, because I've got no doubt there's some actual talent on that show. Um, But the the guy who's um, directing the Annie Get Your Gun, um, Coy, he's fantastic. And I love him. And I'd watch him go through direction any day of the week. But everyone else, um, if you ever thought your problems were kind of, you know, people sort of said to you, like, you know, what, maybe we'll let a few things go. Or maybe uh, you should put your life into kind of perspective and be happy with what you got. Watch these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. you're it's the best dose of therapy you'll ever have if you ever need a slap in the mouth to say oh man i gotta wake up and start doing stuff then yeah this is it okay well i can't say i watched anything that deep (laughs) i actually that made me so happy i feel like i've been given such a gift (laughs) i watched the first season of marvel rising which i'd been intrigued about mainly because i'm such a spider gwen fan mm. um and really the first season is about her um each episode is about four to five minutes long it's like six episodes because these were little shorts that disney was dropping in on their channel uh and there's other seasons beyond that but i just wanted to check it out because they had these really cool figures that came out looked a lot like the figures they made for oh crap the star wars animated series you know they had ahsoka yeah. and padme and mm-hmm. all of them um, it looked a lot like those figures, only they were superheroes, although they call Spider-Gwen Ghost Spider. In fact, I was at the comic book store the other day, and they have comics with Spider-Gwen now that say Ghost Spider. But it was a good little show. Um, I'm glad I watched it. I plan on watching the next one. I mean, the whole first season, even though it only, you know, each one was about five minutes. I mean, they had Patriot, they had Quake, they had Miss Marvel, they had Squirrel Girl, and of course they had Spider-Gwen. They just all called her Ghost Spider. Everybody's trying to figure out whether she's a good or a bad guy because she was at the scene of uh, this kid getting killed who was her who was Gwen Stacy's best friend or one of his really good friends named Kevin. You know, it was just one of those things where after the villain had done their thing, she shows up and she's the only one there with the body. So everybody thinks she's now this vigilante that has gone bad. And her father is still the chief of police, so he's really out to get her. So there are some parallels to the types of stories you find in the comics with uh, Spider Gwen, but um, it's a fun little show. It's it's well done. The voice acting's good, and it's an opportunity, you know, especially with like Spider Gwen. You know, before Spider Man into the Spider Verse, this was like one of the first times we really had a chance to see Spider Gwen on uh, on TV or on on media outside of comic books. And I think it's still a lot of fun to watch her do her thing, even in this little show. So I'll give a shout to that one as well, mate. You said about the toys um, a couple of years ago, my kids. My my youngest, in fact, said, hey, Dad, I'd like a spider gram for Christmas, and they make those now. So I was like, oh, yeah, no props. So then when she opened up her presents Christmas morning, she had a spider gram, and she got the squirrel girl uh, the, with the variant costume bits, and she got the America Chavez, and she got the Quake, the Daisy. And she was like, oh, but I only wanted spider gram. That's crazy I got all these. And I said, oh, well, best leave them in the box then. Just don't play with them. Just leave them alone. Yeah, that'd be good. I'll take care of those for you. So, yeah, shout out to those toys. They're they're pretty cool. Our featured discussion today is something that we all got to watch. The film Stargirl with Grace Vanderwall, which was really kind of interesting because my wife and I watch every single season of America's Got Talent. We remember when she won that as a little girl. 
Uh, she's grown up a little more. She's a little taller now, but still doing her thing with the ukulele, as uh, Nathan mentioned earlier in the show. Um, and she's the star of this movie that was originally a, a, a book. I didn't really have a whole lot of expectations going into this other than, you know, it was clear that it's just about this girl that walks into this town and has everybody talking. And I knew one of the reasons is because she she carried around a ukulele and sang every once in a while. That's all I could really pull from it. I had no idea really what to expect out of it than that. But I thought a way to start off by discussing this would be to get to kind of the review of it all at the end and just kind of hit some of the story elements. As we get into this first group of things I want to ask you all about, what's kind of interesting about this story, I think, is you find yourself wrestling with that suspension of disbelief, but not in a way that takes away from the film. You end up just not caring, which is a good thing. What I mean is, and of course, I haven't been in high school for quite a few years, but I still sit there and think, okay, especially in today's environment where everybody's so judgmental and bullying is much worse than it was and all that stuff that we hear so much about, I did find myself frequently wondering as things happened in this movie, is that the way high school kids would react to this? Is that how high school kids would react to this girl? Is that how they would react to her doing this? And, I mean, I guess that's fair and not fair because, um, you know, there's probably places where things are a little different. And I think that's what's established earlier in this early in this film is that this is a very different type of town, very different type of school. And they were used to just things being kind of bland. But the thing is, is I find that the film itself is really isn't trying to be anything it's not. And there's something kind of sweet about that to the point where you don't care whether that's a yes or no question. And the first question that made me start thinking about this a little bit was her name. Whoa, now that thunder I'm hearing. Yeah, I heard it too. <laughs> that is some serious thunder. Um, the only person I really saw react to her name the way I think most people would, other than when she was asked, is that the, you know, is that the name that you were born with? But that's, that still was very passive compared to how the lead character's mom reacted was, uh, was one of the first things I thought about. I mean, what that would be like walking around today's schools and saying, that's your name. Um, you know, cause there's always that running joke too, when, you know, uh, parents are coming up with names for their kids. Sometimes that occasional name comes up and the parents go, Oh crap. If we name him or her that they'll get bullied, <laughs> they'll get bullied in school. If we call them, if we give them that name. I mean, what do you think about that just from a story perspective and how you thought people reacted to it in the story? You know, I think the way the mom reacted is sort of the typical reaction, um, but as far as just her with a bunch of her peers, I can honestly see that being a pretty low key moment because, you know, if she she's obviously got this whole entire look, this whole entire thing. And if I think back to, you know, when I was in high school, if somebody, you know, was leaning that hard into whatever, you know, image they were projecting and then introduced themselves to me as star girl, you know, yeah. Sure. <laughs> like, it, it seems you're pretty committed. So sure. And, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, going to be a few mean people. But, you know, otherwise, people just sort of accepted it, you know, because she was just seemed to be sort of a genuinely kind person. And this image that she had was, you know, entirely benign. So I, I think it was pretty accurate, actually. I, there was a lot of suspension of disbelief as far as, you know, a lot of the things that she did. But as far as her name goes, you know, I can see a lot of people just being okay with it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the the other things they used to define her weirdness, you know, oh, she wears like weird kind of thrift sort of clothes and crochet things. And she listens to records on a record player. Yeah, it's not that weird. So, yeah, I, I kind of get it. Maybe when the book was written back in, was it 2000, 2001, maybe that would have elicited uh, a few more eyebrows then. But um, I will tell you that the name I gave my child is not the name that they like to go by because they don't like it and I don't push it because hopefully one day they'll go back to it. And uh, to everyone else, they don't introduce themselves with their birth name. They just say, hey, I'm Sage, what's up? And I have to go just grit my teeth and say, yep, that's my Sagey. And, you know, it, it, it is what it is. So, yeah, I, I think that that's probably a theme that's probably a little bit more resonant back in the day, to tell you the truth. Okay. <clears throat> 
The other thing that was kind of a neat moment, and obviously kind of an inciting incident type moment for the story, was when after the band plays, this tiny little band this school has, she takes it upon herself to walk out there and sing this song. And I got to say, I really like later in the story how the lead uh, male character, how he um, described what happened through defining what their mascot was, <laughs> the mud frogs. Yeah talking about how we were mud frogs. We just stayed under the mud for the longest time, and then when she showed up, we decided to come out. And that was the moment that really first turned it around, was when she sang um, that song. And then, you know, everybody just thought that was such a wonderful moment and kind of got everybody hyped, reminded everybody to be proud of something they were a part of. And the football team goes out there and actually scores. <laughs> and everybody's kind of excited. So that was another moment that had me at one point thinking, okay, what if this happened? You know, because I, I don't know, maybe I'm a cynic because I'm sitting there at times thinking, you know, oh, geez, you know, what would they re would everybody really be on board with this? Would they really react this way? But then, like I said, I'd switch back again and just not care because I really was much more interested in just the story they were trying to tell. So I just accepted it for what it was. And thought that was kind of a cool way to get everything started. It does start off a little slow, uh, but then when that happens and you start to see really where this is all going to go, that was probably the moment that started it all. What did you think about that scene and how it started to turn things in that school around after she sings the song in the middle of a football game? I had to warm up to it. I was still warming up to the movie at this point. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, part of the magic of this movie is, you know, what kept me going through this part because you know i don't warm up easily to musical numbers generally right. yeah um and this one it it does just kind of come out of nowhere um but by the end of it i was like okay you know i can sort of tell what this movie is going to be but you know i'm not entirely sure um but it it wasn't you know like any you know, theme defining moment for me. It was mostly just like, okay, this is non-offensive right now. I can see <laughs> that they're, you know, they're setting some sort of tone. Yeah. Um, she's obviously got a profound effect on these people, but as soon as she started having that profound effect, I was like, okay, in what way is this going to be twilight zoned? Like, am I going to find out that at the end of the movie, she's been dead the whole time? <laughs> like, you know, some sort of thing is afoot here so that's when i first knew that something strange was going on i wasn't sure what it was not the musical number that sold me yeah no i don't know if i was sold yet because i like, like you said and like i was just kind of mentioning um it became acceptable a little more acceptable later the only time the music took me out of it i mean literally took me out of it more so than that one was when they had one later where she is doing a full number with the band and the thing is, the camera is moving in all these different directions, including up, and she's looking at it. Oh, she does that a bunch of times. Yeah, though. and that's what took me out of it, because now she's doing a music video. I didn't feel like she was singing to the crowd anymore. She was singing to the camera. And I thought that was kind of, you know, potentially a misstep in what they shot there. I mean, I realize it looks a little weird, but I mean, people's, I mean, there's lots of scenes in movies where people are on stage singing in a, in a band. I mean, they're never looking at the camera. They're looking at the audience. And there were times where she would look at the camera and the camera would be in these kind of off places. And that took me out of it a little bit because now I felt like it was a music video and I found myself thinking, okay, is this something they didn't think through. And then, you know, by the time it was over, I just kind of went, oh, well. Uh, yeah, you know, um, that first song, the reprise with the cheerleading people, and to a degree as well, the bit where um, Homeboy gets to sing his song at the very end and the music's still playing, even though they're all outside and dancing, and, the you know, the magical amplifiers and microphones and all the rest of it that exists to kind of you know, get that sound across to everyone, no matter how far away they are, or if they're in the middle of a high school football stadium. Um, you know, little Grace, Grace Vanderwell, she got a big voice, I suppose, but is it that big? And that's the thing that sort of took me out of the movie. There are some moments of incredible intimacy and, and some really poignant, lovely touches in that movie, mm -hmm. but the music isn't one of them. Um, not because it's bad, just because of the way it's handled. And like you say, uh, it feels like, it's a cutaway to a Grace Vanderwaal music video as opposed to something that's aimed at the crowd 
that, you know, wait, who's that on the field? I can barely see it. I can barely hear her. Wait, no, what's that song? There's none of that. It's just like she comes out there, like apropos of nothing, belts out the track, and all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, we're super into it. And um, those are the bits I find it hard to, harder to sort of suspend my, uh, my belief in. You know, um, so yeah, I, I would agree with you that what should have been a strength, Grace Vanderwell, I mean, come on, uh, wasn't initially, like like uh, Regina said, it made me a little bit more reticent to sort of get involved in the movie. Like, it didn't pull me in the same way. It ruined my immersion. I just feel like maybe there was a better way if, if you know, the star of the show, no pun intended, is going to be a girl whose shtick is that she you know, plays the ukulele and kind of sings in falsetto, then maybe why is her entrance into everything and basically her launching point from then on that she leads like a marching band for a football team? That just seems a little bit mismatched, like a little bit loud. It seems like the wrong vehicle for her, I guess. We keep talking about Leo in this, and his story is kind of interesting too because he's he's kind of the representative of you know everybody in that town at least from a story's perspective and maybe even us to some degree as we're trying to figure out who this girl is and why she can change so many things the way she does and why she thinks the way she does and then of course later in the story we you know you start to talk about how much of that is genuine or well placed which i thought was really a a really good part of the movie too um because it would have been very um easy just to let her just come in brighten this place up and everybody's happy the end but there was um, a really nice turn on that later. But what I wanted to touch on, too, I don't have a problem with this, but I just wanted to ask you all about it because, you know, I got myself so immersed in the story and so immersed in her that I didn't necessarily care about this too much from a motivation perspective. Do you think it was necessary for them to be kind of a boyfriend-girlfriend couple in this? Because I, I found myself wondering, not that you have to have, to have all these answers in a movie that's really this sweet and simple, but because I wondered, you know, what drew her to him being as different as they are? There's not a whole lot we really see that develops that relationship. It's just, you know, they kind of hang out and and then at one point in time she kisses him and I guess they're dating. And that obviously impacts his social life a little bit and hers. And then we see what happens at the end, which we'll get to, but... Do you think they're needed to, they needed to have this romantic element to it? Because the moments where they kissed, I will say this, in a day and age where everything has to be so explicit and so, I guess, descriptive when it comes to relationships and film, it was kind of nice that these were just two people that, for the most part in the movie, had nice little kisses and held hands, and that was the extent of it. I, will, I do think there's actually value in that, but I'm just talking about, from a story perspective, what we know of these two do you think this was a good move or would it have been just as effective if these were just two people intrigued by one another who hung out a lot throughout the story? I think it was an okay move. I think it was a default move because that's just sort of what you do with the kind of manic pixie dream girl storyline. But with this particular story, it didn't feel forced or misplaced um, simply because when you are a boy that age Mm -hmm. and you're having these, you know, really critical moments. Like, you know, his mom mentions later in the movie, you know, you're really trying to figure out who you are right now. Yep. You're learning all this stuff. And you see throughout the movie, he learns a lot from Stargirl. Yep. You open up to somebody that much at that young of an age, you know, romantic feelings are bound to be created. Good point. And that's not necessarily, you know, it, nothing in the movie implies that, you know, they're going to, you know, find each other later on and get married. It's not right. one of those things. Yeah. But they share such incredibly intimate moments, like emotionally intimate moments, that that thing is just naturally bound to develop. Yeah, with the um I know with the book, the timeline is flipped around a little bit. The hot seat thing happens before and she gets absolutely excoriated on that and Leo thinks that she's real brave for standing up and talking about her stuff and it's in that sort of praise of her that he sort of discovers her a bit more. Um, that doesn't happen in this one the same way. You're kind of left to, um, you know, the the Archie character kind of helps nod these things along a little bit and kind of it sounds like he encourages their curiosity of each other sort of behind the scenes to a certain degree. 
he seems to know a lot about the two of them, you know, both kind of passing by at different times. Um, the thing that kind of got me to that place where you're talking about, Scott, was whenever they were listening to music and she put on thir- or told him to listen to 13 by Big Star. Yep. And that song is that is just hopelessly crushing that song. I just adore it so much. I'll, um, it's one of those songs that like, um, to make you feel my love or something like that. One of those songs you put on and I'm in tears. It's just like, Oh my God, you just melt when you hear it. Um, it Rolling Stone called it one of the top 500 songs ever. And they're not wrong. They're, they're really not wrong. It's a fantastic song. It doesn't matter who covers it. And, um, as soon as he heard that, like you heard that in in the, in his head, I guess um, after ha- they had their moment, that's it. I was there. I was sold on it, hook, line, and sinker. Who wouldn't fall for that? Who wouldn't believe in that relationship at that moment? And that was a real beautiful move by, you know, by the writers, by the production team to do something like that because it got you from A to B real quick. Especially if you're already familiar with the song, because I think a lot of people know they're just like, oh my gosh, it clicks. You know that that hopeless adolescence, like mm-hmm. you, you're just there. Now we're getting into the next part where I found myself again gauging whether or not I could believe high school students reacting to things a certain way. You really have to buy into the the closeness, the and how small I guess the little town is to really block out things uh, that you might be guessing as far as a reaction because I thought you know when it came time for well first off I thought it was amazing that after being so bad they made it that far <laughs> oh yeah like season, all the way in the championship game I'm like whoa I found that kind of interesting and then of course you know the star quarterback he's like the stud quarterback and this this team that they're playing has um has won it before um and they're driving at the end and then the quarterback gets hurt and I mean hurt really bad, and they have to carry him off. Stargirl runs out there and not only kneels with him, leaves the place in the ambulance, um, which shocks everybody. And I thought their conversation that that Leo and and Stargirl have about why that happened was a good conversation. I I don't know. It it's it seemed weird to me that the entire school turns on this girl for that reason. I know they all said that she was their good luck charm. And they lost the game. But, I mean, for a team that was, you know, for a group of people that was so used to losing, you make it all the way to the championship somehow and you lose and you're you're thinking it's this girl's fault. I mean, that, I don't know. That's a, That was a tougher sell. It was a tougher sell that the entire school felt that way because, you know, in general, I mean, there is a lot invested in people's feelings in high schools today. And I think a lot of people would have supported what she did or at least what she was trying to do. And I don't know. I, it was hard for me to wrap my head around saying she's the reason we lost the game. <laughs> I mean, you were already on the verge of losing the game. The only thing that really got explained was once she, you know, went on the hot seat and that girl talked about the bike. Mm-hmm. You know, I I took it upon myself because I'm a good person and I'm I want to do good things and I'm going to get this guy a bike or get this guy's bike fixed. And it turns out you can you can sometimes get too caught up in your own mission to not realize you may not know the whole story. There is at least an explanation from her personal story. And I understand that this was a part in the overall story where things have to turn and turn into a problem for the main characters to, to figure out. And I think it's fine. I just think the tougher sell for me was the, you know, the impression that the entire school turned on her on that. Mm-hmm. But maybe... You know, maybe I'm just supposed to believe that because, hey, it's a small town. Everybody kind of knows each other and thinks the same way as a collective. You know, if she'd done the African Anteater ritual, they all would have done it too or something. I don't know. So I I did think it was incredibly bizarre that the entire school turned on her over this. Um, You know, if it had been like, you know, a group of much cooler kids walked up to her and were like, hey, F your school, come hang out with us. And then she left and did that. You know, sure, maybe an amount of outrage would occur. Um, But for her to leave with an injured person, I feel like in real life, a few people would be like, dude, where's she going? Because, you know, she hadn't told anyone, you know, what was going on. So there'd be some curiosity, but then the game would continue. You know, that's pretty much it. But, you know, once they tied it around with the girl, her brother not having the ability to ride a bike and 
anymore or ever again. Um, and that ended up, you know, backfiring on her. That was much more believable. I was able to get over the, the football game thing. I mean, they really, really leaned into it, though. Like, when she came back to school on Monday and everybody's like, why is Stargirl here? It's like, because this is where she goes to school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, she can't not come to school. What the hell are you talking about? And again, with the, with the bike thing to a degree, and again, book's a little different. Um, Hillary in in the book is a bit more of an antagonist. She's like the popular girl, the mean girl, and talks a lot of smack about Stargirl all the way through. Um, so the character's rewritten a bit for this. But as far as uh, uh, a, a foil to sort of show how selfish she is and how inconsiderate she is, I just want you to put this uh, scenario in your head. Um, imagine your next-door neighbour got hurt and you, they just got from the hospital, and so you take him a casserole, and then they, you open, they open the door and say, "Would you bring me?" And like, oh, I bought you a casserole. Yeah, what's in it? Uh, oh, it's like my grandma's broccoli cheese and rice casserole. You monster! I'm vegan. I don't eat cheese. How dare you? You'd be there like, okay, you're the a hole. I was trying to be cool, and so Star Girl with a bike. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tiny bit all considered, but she's still trying to do a nice thing. And you don't get vilified for that, right? You just say, hey, mate, I'm in the wrong direction there. But good try, though. Fair play. Appreciate what you're trying to do. Everyone sees the good behind that. They don't think you're a jerk unless you go to Micah in Arizona, which, you know, everyone <laughs> would totally you say the shunning. Let the shunning commence. I know why they did it. I don't like that they did it. The book has a more gradual turn. For me, the beauty of the moments, uh, the beauty of that movie is is in the, say those those quiet moments, the the big sort of set piece, like the big story beats. That's not why you should watch this movie. So yeah, again, like Regina said, give that bit just you know give it a blind eye, just let it go. Don't worry about it. It gets better. Or does it? <laughs> or does it? You know, that's a really good point. I, Nathan, I'm really glad you you read the book as well. One of the best discussions I had with story expert Robert McKee, we discussed the challenges of taking a book and turning it into a movie. And Robert's point was, you know, the reason why it's so challenging and so hard to pull off is because when you write something in book form and all you're doing is you, you're reading words, he says the writer in that case has the, has the ability, because they've got tons of space to do it, to wrap you around their finger in a way where you just keep going and you don't stop to ask questions. He talked about the Hunger Games prime example. He said, you know, when you're reading it, the way it's written, you don't stop and think about you know, why would anybody team up when it's every man for himself? <laughs> you know, uh, but when you're watching it on screen and it's all, you know, it's all visual, then it's more likely to uh, trigger the quote unquote stupid questions about some things that questionable things that might be happening. And there's obviously a little bit of that here because, yeah, in the same in the same vein, they can't take that kind of time like you spoke of in the book uh, for an hour and 45 minute movie. That's going to go on a streaming service. So there, there is some of the, some of this is probably due to the challenge of uh, adaptation, which is really, really tough. Mm -hmm. As we wrap everything up, she makes it to uh, the speech competition. She was going to speak on the government and internet censorship as Susan, um, and then drops the cards and goes out there, still dressed as Susan, but gives a star girl. Holy crap! Now it's over here. <laughs> 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 we don't have a defibrillator here so if all of a sudden i don't talk anymore you might want to call 911 <laughs> <laughs> she gives that speech which was a good speech and i think it really kind of drove home kind of the whole message of the film along with just the uh, highlights of the importance of being yourself you mentioned big star i mean i i love the cars uh, I can't imagine the eighties without the cars. I love that. Um, just what I needed was a central part of this. That album was a central part of this, especially after we tragically lost Rick Ocasek not long ago. It was really kind of cool just because of that to see the work kind of celebrated this way. When she surprised Leo with his chance to sing on stage, um, I thought it was going to be that song that he sang with her in her room. I didn't realize it was going to be just what I needed. And I really kind of liked that whole scene. 
And then, of course, you know, she says she's sorry. That's the other part of this where you kind of draw the line as to what looks good in film and what might actually happen in real life. It was really interesting that she was the only girl standing there. I mean, I get that. Maybe she wouldn't have run out there and celebrate with Stargirl when she still ticked at her. But then everybody stops and watches the exchange. (laughs) And she says, I'm sorry. And then when she walks away, she doesn't come back. Despite everything that happened, she's kind of a legend. You know, everybody talks about her. I thought it was cool about how they talked about um, all the different stories and how sometimes they got a little um, exaggerated as the stories grew. And I will say that, and I think this is a credit to the movie, you know, I was kind of sad to see it ended that way. I get why they did it, though. It makes sense. But the fact that I cared that, you know, that that Leo wasn't going to have her to talk to her in his life anymore or she couldn't have this impact on this school anymore, after all we'd been through... I, I kind of was sad that it had to go that way, but I understood why. What did you all think about how this whole thing kind of came together and ended? It was sweet in the kind of whimsical way the rest of the movie was. Um, it sort of felt like a Wes Anderson film for kids. Part of me thought she was going to end up disappearing or you know, completely not being real or being an angel or something like that. And I'm glad they didn't do that. Um, but I'm glad that they were able to give her a similar effect as to say, oh, no, she was just, you know, this miracle person who did all these wonderful things. They were able to do that without actually making her like a mythological creature. Um, So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I I just thought it was kind of sweet, but it was kind of sad. And that's how I know that I liked the movie more than I thought I did, because it did make me a little sad at the end. You know, it was it was the ending. I think the movie was uh, always going to take you to, um, and that's not a bad thing. As I say, I think it, it was actually quite endearing overall. Yeah. Um, again, the the musical bit at the end did sort of pull me out of it a little bit. You know, the the band count in for a long time, but then lo and behold, he, when he's up there and he starts doubting out those words, it's like awesome, and everyone's like, "Yeah, you go." And that again, not high school. We we all know that. Um, not when any of us went there does that happen but again like a small town I mean I guess not a lot goes on they're just glad to see you get up and do something I suppose Um, you you know and again the bit at the end where they sort of I I knew this bit wasn't going to happen but again I didn't know how far they were deviating from the books I'm super glad that uh, even though they went and ran outside and she disappeared, that it wasn't actually like a Cara Thrace kind of thing from Battlestar Galactica. Oh, she was oh an angel. Gosh. So I'm right? so glad they went didn't go down that way. I, I'm really surprised they didn't leave the door open for a sequel because, you know, they talk about meeting up in years to come and all the rest of that, uh, you know, the indelible mark she left upon all of them and, and Leo especially. Um, when, you know, there's a whole other book that deals with her fallout with that relationship and her trying to get over him and, you know, feeling a little bit betrayed. Yeah. You know, it it was, it was the ending that movie deserved and it was quite a sweet one. It did reinforce that message, which, you know, just that kind of kindness and a little bit out of the ordinary in that context is extraordinary. And why wouldn't you want a little bit of that in your life? You know, that that's just a very sweet, wholesome, pure thing. It was a very Disney plus movie. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Uh, it was the Hallmark movie. I, I never knew I wanted, but I, 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 I thought the, the ending was, was about pitch perfect for that. To tell you the truth. Yeah. And you, you briefly mentioned Archie. I, we definitely want to point out uh, Mr. Esposito's part in this. We just got done seeing him in <laughs> play a really bad guy. <laughs> in, uh, in the Mandalorian and you know he had a small role in this but you've got Leo who doesn't have a father you have a uh, star girl who doesn't have her father around and they both come to him for some of that fatherly guidance and I thought that was a really uh, cool part for him in all of this um, I would and that kind of points out everything else I mean the I think the performances in, in this was fine it felt a little choppy in the beginning but I think they kind of found their rhythm as the movie went along mm-hmm. This is definitely worth a watch. I think it's definitely worth the watch. It's something everybody can watch together. It's a really simple story. Um, I think there's things about your individuality and finding yourself and people who are different from others um, that you can have those type of talks with your kids if you watch this film. I, I really think even if you 
you know, might have even been in my shoes and looked at it and thought, yeah, that's probably kind of a sweet little movie, but I don't need to see it. I actually think you might be surprised. I mean, you heard both me and Regina say, you know, we I think there were moments in this that surprised how much we liked what was happening. And by the time it was over, that's when you really realize how much you liked it, how sweet yeah. it really was. And that's the moment you really should, because I found myself kind of thinking back on it, too, after I uh, finished watching it. And those are definitely uh, the best type of movie. So, um you know, I think overall I would give, you know, if I had to grade the movie, I'd give it a, a solid B, B plus maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a B plus. I don't, I don't regret the time I spent watching it. Um, it wasn't something I needed to watch, um, but it wasn't, you know, even though it was about an experience that I haven't been partaking in in a, many, many years, it, it wasn't completely unrelatable to me. You know, it still translated well, and I could still, mm -hmm. you know, sympathize with what they were going through. Um, I I really, I enjoyed it much more than I thought I would. So I definitely wouldn't recommend being wary of it in any way. If you even feel an inkling about watching it, just go ahead and click play. Yeah, as far as um, Disney movies go, for plus, you know, they're 50% by my reckoning because noel sucked great trailer movie sucked Ooh. lady and the tramp actually was good haven't watched the uh the old uh dog movie yet but one of these days we'll get regina on board with that and we will <laughs> i'm sure um negatory so, good buddy so, <laughs> negative ghost rider the pattern is full so um, you know so we're 50 percent on that i will say that i thought the trailer was a really well put together trailer and certainly captivated me and the movie is when it shines, when it's just uh, Leo and Stargirl on the screen, or mm -hmm. if it's one of, uh, Leo playing off uh, Giancarlo Esposito, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. When it's uh, when you look at the soundtrack, say 13, so you're getting points for that ju just because. But that bit when they're in the desert, um, yeah, that's marvelous. I'm not so far removed from my youth that I don't remember what that felt like when that happened for me. And it really tugs on your heartstrings without being too sentimental about it. And I don't think you can be because it's Disney Plus and we know all, all know why we're, why we're here. It's it's worth the feels. You'll, you'll get them. You know, if you've been in that spot, you'll feel it and you'll believe it for just a split second. And that's just credit to the performances and the cinematography there. Solid B. Great movie. Mm -hmm. You should watch it. Yeah, and I think it's worth pointing out, too, that both Stargirl, which was written in 2000 or published in 2000, and then the sequel, Love Stargirl, which came out in 2007, both written by Jerry Spinelli. Those are still available if you decide to uh, you want to go read at least the first book in the series, which is more or less what this movie was based on. And yeah, it'll be really interesting to see if they decide to make a film adaptation of Love Stargirl as they did with the books. Well, that wraps up today's episode of the Disney Plus Streamcast. Visit us online at DisneyPlusStreamcast.com or on Twitter at DisneyPlusCast. We will be back next week with another episode, and since it's there already, we thought, what the heck, let's talk about Frozen 2. That'll be next week on the Disney Plus Streamcast. 